Chapter One of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams. Chapter One Up the Amazon. Guard this letter as you would your life. Mr. Stunnart spoke in a low, tense tone as he glanced around the waiting room at Idlewild Airport. Biff Brewster felt a sudden surge of excitement when he took the envelope that the grey-haired man handed him. The envelope was tightly sealed, and it was addressed to Biff's father, Thomas Brewster, at the Hotel Jacques at Manus, Brazil. In the upper corner was the return address of the Ajax Mining Corporation in New York City. Greg Stunnett was the president of the company, and Mr. Brewster was its chief field engineer. Since you are flying to Brazil to join your father, Mr. Stunnett continued, I have decided to have you deliver this letter personally, rather than take the risk of it falling into the wrong hands. He paused, gave Biff a keen, steady glance, and asked, did your father tell you why he was going to the headwaters of the Amazon River? He wrote that he was going on a jungle safari, replied Biff, and he invited me to fly to Brazil and join him as a birthday present. Biff was thinking back to his birthday party at the Brewster home in Indianapolis less than a week ago. His mother had brought in a cake with sixteen lighted candles that Biff had blown out with a single puff to the delight of the twins, Ted and Monica, who were five years younger than Biff. But the big surprise was when Biff's mother had given him the birthday letter from his dad. Next had come the excitement of packing, when it dawned on Biff that nearly all his birthday presents were clothes and equipment he could use on a tropical trip. Then Biff had flown to New York where Mr. Stannart had met him to put him on the plane for Brazil. Your father is bound on a highly important and secret mission for our company, Mr. Stannart confided now. He is going far up the Rio Negro, which joins the Amazon just below the city of Manaus. The party, supposedly, will be looking for sites for rubber plantations. Mr. Stannart paused, then said solemnly, Your father will be looking for gold, a fabulous gold mine about which we have secret information. But here in New York, he went on, we have just discovered that there has been a leak in that information. We have learned that certain people would do anything to stop your father and get to the mine first. Even now, he may be in danger. But Dad didn't say anything about it, because he doesn't know about it. He may change his mind about letting you accompany him after you give him this letter. It will tell him all he needs to know. Biff put the letter deep down into his coat pocket. Mr. Stannard nodded approvingly. Be careful what you say to strangers, he warned Biff. And above all, guard that letter. It was nearly time for the departure of Biff's plane. Mr. Stannard explained that it would take him to Belém, the capital city of the Brazilian state of Para, not far from the mouth of the Amazon. There, Biff would change to a plane for Manaus, a thousand miles up the great river. Mr. Stannard studied the other passengers who were waiting to board the plane. He said to Biff in parting in a low but confidential tone, You won't have any trouble on this flight, but be careful after you leave Belém. The long trip south did prove uneventful. During daylight, the plane was over the Atlantic Ocean, and darkness had settled when it reached the coast of Brazil. Biff landed at Belém at dawn, so it wasn't until he had changed to the plane for Manaus that he gained his first view of the Brazilian jungle. He saw it from a seat beside the window as the plane climbed above Belém, a vast, solid mass of billowing green that looked ready to swallow the city that spread below. Then the jungle ended and the plane was flying over a huge expanse of brownish water streaked with waves of white. This was the Amazon River, 
stretching as far as the eye could see. A smooth voice purred from beside Biff's shoulder. It looks more like an ocean than a river, doesn't it? Biff turned to meet the gaze of the smiling man sitting beside him, whose eyes looked sharp even through his dark green glasses. The large lenses gave an olive hue to the sleek, oval face that narrowed to a pointed chin. Oh, Rio Mar, the smiling man continued, that is what Brazilians call the Amazon. It means the river sea in Portuguese. Do you understand the language? A little, replied Biff, but I know Spanish better. He was about to add that he had learned both from his father. Then, remembering Mr. Stannart's warning to be careful when he talked to strangers, Biff stated simply but truthfully, I've been studying Spanish in school. You will need to speak Portuguese, the man declared, if you are stopping off anywhere between Belem and Manus, he poured inquiringly. Then, getting no response, he added, if you go farther up the Amazon or any of its tributaries, you will need to know the dialects of Indian tribes as well. The stranger's easy, persuasive tone almost caused Biff to remark that he was going on beyond Manus, but he caught himself in time and said nothing. You may have to talk fast too, Biff's fellow passenger continued. Those tribes are often dangerous. You are sure to find headhunters among them. This time Biff asked a question. Have you been among the headhunters, sir? The stranger's smile widened. My name is Serbot, Nicholas Serbot. And yours? Bruce Brewster, my friends call me Biff. Nicholas Serbot inclined his head politely. No, I've never been among the headhunters, Biff. I come to Manus occasionally to do business for some European concerns that I represent, mostly in rubber. My dad is in Manas, Biff volunteered. I'm meeting him there. Perhaps he will take you on a jungle safari. They organize such trips in Manas. That sounds great, exclaimed Biff. I'll mention it to dad. Tell him to inquire at the Hotel Amazonas, suggested Serbot. Meanwhile, he leaned toward Biff as he spoke. You may find the scene below quite interesting. They had reached the head of the Paro River, the principal mouth of the Amazon, 60 miles above Bellum. The plane was thrumming over a gigantic carpet of thickly tufted green, furrowed by a maze of irregular streams. The region of the Thousand Islands, Serbot explained. Those channels that twist through the solid jungle are called the Narrows. They come from the main course of the Amazon, and most of them are deep enough to be navigable. Below, Biff saw an ocean-going freighter working up through a watery passage. It looked like a toy boat from this altitude, and occasionally it was swallowed by the thick foliage that jutted over the channel only to emerge from the green arcade. Soon the boat was far behind, and Biff watched the narrow channels widen and merge into a limitless, white-capped sea, the great Amazon itself. Serbot's purring voice and the steady drone of the plane's motors had a lulling effect. Biff's eyes closed to avoid the glare of the tropical sun. Soon he was asleep. He dreamed that he was back at Idlewild, with Mr. Stannart's voice repeating, Guard this letter as you would your life. Guard this letter. In the dream, invisible fingers seemed to be plucking the precious envelope, drawing it up and out of Biff's pocket. With a sudden start, Biff awoke and shot his own hand to his pocket, where it met the crinkle of paper. The dream had been realistic in one respect. As he dozed, Biff must have been slumping down into his seat, causing the envelope to work upward every time he hunched his shoulders. A few inches more and it would have fallen from his pocket. Or was that the answer? What if those phantom fingers had been real instead of mere figments of a dream? As he thrust the envelope far down into his inside pocket and buttoned his coat for safer keeping, Biff Brewster shot a suspicious glance towards his companion of the plane trip the smooth-spoken man who called himself Mr. Nicholas Serbot. End of chapter 1
Biff was wide awake now, the drone of the plane growing louder in his ears. With it, his suspicions of Serbot faded. The smiling man was leaning back in his seat, his own eyes closed as if in sleep. His hands were folded loosely across his stomach. For the first time, Biff saw why Serbot wore that constant smile. The left side of his mouth was curled to match the right, which was drawn upward by a scar that began at the corner of his lips and became increasingly jagged until it ended beside his right eyebrow. Before, the large rims and green tint of the sunglasses had helped to hide the scar, but Serbot had removed them before he went to sleep. Now, as Biff studied him, Serbot opened his eyes slowly and gave Biff a sleepy glance. Realising that Biff had observed the scar, Serbot raised his right hand and traced it lightly with his forefinger. A decoration I received during World War II, he commented, while I was working with the French underground. A Nazi spy tried to give me this. Graphically, Serbot swept his hand across his throat, but I managed to save my neck. I received this instead. Serbot clenched his left fist as though it contained a weapon. He grabbed his left wrist with his right hand and shook his head. If anyone attacks you with a knife or gun, don't try to stop him that way, he said. It won't work fast enough, as I found out. Hit his wrist like this, Serbot opened his right hand, bent it backward, and drove it against the left wrist with the heel of your hand, upward and outward. Try it. Biff practiced the action a few times and apparently won Serbot's approval, for the smiling man added, That not only will stop him, it will jar the weapon from his grasp, enabling you to snatch it all in the same move. Serbot demonstrated that too. Then, Noting that some of the other passengers were beginning to look their way, Serbot changed the subject abruptly. Leaning towards Biff, he began pointing out more sights from the window as the plane followed the north bank of the river. There, the jungle had opened into widespread grazing lands studded by a range of low, flat-topped mountains. Perched on one summit was a little town that Serbot said was called Monte Alegre. Then they were far out over the river again, and the Amazon once more resembled a choppy yellow sea until the order came to fasten safety belts. The plane was coming to a landing at Santarum on the south bank. Serbot pointed out to Biff the wide Tapajos River, which disgorged a huge flood into the turbulent Amazon, splotching the yellow tide with long streaks of green that looked like washed from the jungle and shone with emerald brilliance in the noonday sun. The plane roared off again, and at Obidos, eighty miles further upstream, the Amazon narrowed to a single deep channel only a mile and a quarter wide, with the walls of solid forests fringing both bluffs. Later the river widened again, and Serbot indicated small settlements built on high stilts in clearings back from the bank. Those show you how high the river rises, Serbot told Biff. Often it overflows its banks for many miles on both sides. Some of the native villages are so far off in the jungle that they can only be reached when the Amazon is in flood. Between pointing out these interesting scenes, Serbot talked occasionally of his war experiences, and Biff, wide awake and alert ever since his morning nap, was enjoying the trip more and more. He realised that he was gaining a slight preview of the Brazilian jungle that might prove helpful when he and his father set out on the safari that was actually to be a gold hunt, but he was careful to avoid answering any direct questions that Serbot put to him. It was late afternoon when Serbot indicated a great, dark swirl of water that merged with the muddy Amazon, marking the mouth of another huge tributary. The black water of the Rio Negro, defined Serbot. From here, it is only ten miles up to Manus. Soon the plane landed at the Manus airport, and a few minutes later Biff was being welcomed by his father, a tall, rugged man with dark hair and tanned, square-jawed face, an older counterpart of Biff himself, except for the boy's blonde hair. But when Biff looked around for Mr. Serbot, hoping to introduce him to Mr. Brewster, he found to his surprise that his companion of the plane trip was already gone. 
Biff and his dad talked about the family and everything at home while they were picking up Biff's luggage. Mr. Brewster then led the way to a jeep that he had parked outside the airport. Before they started their drive into the city, Biff drew the sealed envelope from his pocket and handed it to his father with the comment, Dad, this is from Mr. Stannart. He told me to guard it carefully, that it is very important. Mr. Brewster tore open the envelope, and Biff watched his expression change as he read the letter. His lips set tightly above his firm jaw, Mr. Brewster thrust the letter into his own pocket. Then he started the jeep. Keeping a sharp eye along the rough road, he asked, Did Mr. Stannart mention what was in the letter? In a way, he did, rejoined Biff. He said we were supposed to be going with a rubber hunting expedition, but that actually we would be looking for gold. You didn't mention that to anyone, did you? interrupted Mr. Brewster anxiously. I mean, while you were on the plane. I only talked to a man named Mr. Serbot, returned Biff, and I even played dumb when he suggested that you take me on a safari. He said we could make arrangements at the Hotel Amazonas. Biff saw his father's taut expression change to one of relief. Mr. Brewster spurted the jeep over a watery stretch of road with the comment, These jeeps have to be real puddle jumpers. You never know how deep some of the mud holes are. The road improved as they swung into the city. It was then that Mr. Brewster asked, Did Mr. Stannart tell you that there might be serious danger now that other persons are after the mine? Yes, he said you must be warned. I suppose that is why he let you come, mused Mr. Brewster. Frankly, I feel he made a mistake, and I should send you straight home. However, if we keep far enough ahead of trouble, it may not catch up with us. Mr. Brewster ended with a reassuring smile. I'll tell you the story from the start, he said. During World War Two, two prospectors, Lou Kirby and Joe Nara, gave up hunting gold and diamonds down in the state of Minas Gerais and came up the Amazon to help gather rubber. They put their profits into food and supplies and kept going north to look for a fabled land of gold, a land called El Dorado. El Dorado! We learned about him in American history, Biff exclaimed. It sounded crazier than science fiction, wasn't El Dorado supposed to be a king who came out of a lake with his body all covered with gold? Originally, yes, returned Mr. Brewster. Then the story became a legend of a golden city and finally a golden land. The Spaniards looked for it, and so did Sir Walter Raleigh. But nobody ever found it. Nobody except Lou Kirby and Joe Nara. Sure that his father was joking, Biff expected a chuckle to follow. But Mr. Brewster was very serious. They uncovered a fabulous Inca mine, resumed Mr. Brewster. It was too far and too difficult to bring the gold down the Amazon. So they worked their way to the Orinoco River, which brought them out through Venezuela. Kirby sent Nara back to the mine and then returned to Minas Gerais, hoping to find someone to help finance the claim. But people either didn't believe his story, or they were the sort he wouldn't trust. But he trusted me, and I believed him when he gave me these. Mr. Brewster brought out of his pocket some small samples of ore that fairly glistened with gold. Biff had learned enough regarding mining and minerals from his dad to recognize the value of these specimens. In an awed tone, Biff asked, Is there much of this in the mine, Dad? A whole mountain full, replied Mr. Brewster, from what Lou Kirby told me before he died. The jeep was rolling smoothly now along a boulevard lined with fig trees, all neatly trimmed to a mushroom shape, but the story of the fabled gold mine interested Biff more than the sights of Manus. Lou gave me a map, continued Mr. Brewster, showing the route that he followed to reach the headwaters of the Orinoco, though it does not give the exact location of the mine. To learn that, we must find Joe Nara. I hope that no one else finds him first. Like the persons mentioned in Mr. Stannart's letter. That's right, Biff. Despite Mr. Stannart's constant urging, the directors of the Ajax Corporation have been painfully slow in providing funds for our trip. Meanwhile, Mr. Stannart says in his letter, certain foreign interests have learned of the mine and have moved into the picture. 
They may be the sort who will stop at nothing to get that mine. Before Biff could ask more questions, the jeep pulled up beside a modest, low-built structure that bore the sign, Hotel Jacquel's. Looking about, Biff was surprised to see that it was growing dark and that the street lamps were already aglow. Night falls swiftly here in the tropics, explained Mr. Brewster, as they went through the hotel lobby and up the stairs to the second floor. That is why I lost no time coming from the airport. The driving is difficult after dark. Mr. Brewster unlocked the door of his room, turned on the light, then halted in amazement. The place was strewn with clothes from his suitcases. Sheets had been ripped from beds and mattresses cut open. Papers were scattered everywhere. In a corner was a framed mirror hanging above a washstand. Mr. Brewster hurried over, took down the mirror and laid it on a table beside a closet door. He pried away the backing of the mirror and brought out a sheet of paper that had been hidden there. This is what they were after, he exclaimed. The one thing they couldn't find, Kirby's map. As Mr. Brewster spoke, the closet door was opening slowly, but it was behind his shoulder and he didn't see it. From the crack slid a long, bare human arm, and a hand reached for the prize that Mr. Brewster flourished. Frantically, Biff shouted, Dad, look out! End of chapter 2 of the Brazilian gold mine mystery. Chapter 3 of Brazilian gold mine mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Hidden Boat House. Mr. Brewster swung about at Biff's warning, an instant too late. The hand had already clutched the map and was snatching it from his grasp. The map tore apart, leaving only a corner in Mr. Brewster's hand. Quickly, Biff's father drove for the closet door, intending to slam it and trap the occupant, map and all. But the man in the closet moved swiftly too. He flung the door wide, and its edge swept past Mr. Brewster's fingers as the man dived under his arm. Biff crouched low, was about to stop the intruder with a football tackle, when Mr. Brewster overtook the fugitive, applied a powerful armhold, and brought him full about. Biff saw that the struggling man's face was masked behind a large knotted bandana handkerchief, and that his rough baggy clothes disguised his height and weight. As he twisted in Mr. Brewster's grasp, the man managed to thrust his hand into the folds of his jacket and whip out a revolver. Coming about, he aimed point-blank at Mr. Brewster, Biff's father dropped away a split second before the revolver barked, its muzzle tonguing flame inches above his head. Then, before the masked man could fire again, Mr. Brewster reeled about, grabbed a small table with both hands, and flung it bodily at his masked foe. The man darted out of the way, only to find Biff blocking his escape. Biff heard a snarl from behind the bandana and saw the glint of the gun barrel as the man swung the weapon with a savage downward stroke. Instinctively, Biff shot his own hand upward, using the trick that Serbot had shown him on the plane that very day. The heel of Biff's hand caught the man's wrist, driving it outward. The impact jolted the gun from his hand, but the weapon scaled toward the side of the room and clattered near the bottom of the wall, where Mr. Brewster sprang across and scooped it from the floor, practically on the rebound. The masked man hadn't tried to retrieve the gun. Instead, he dashed through the doorway to the hall, still clutching the stolen map. Biff raced after him with Mr. Brewster close behind. They might have overtaken the fugitive if he had gone down the stairway to the lobby, but instead he chose a shorter route to a large open window at the other end of the hall. There he leapt a low railing, carrying a loose scream with him. When Biff reached the window and looked down into the dark, the man had vanished in the thick mesh of a tropical foliage that had broken his fall. No use trying to go after him, decided Mr. Brewster ruefully. We don't even know the direction he has taken. The hotel clerk will have heard the shot. We'll let him report the incident to the police. They'll figure it was just a sneak thief. But what about the map? Biff inquired anxiously. How will you find the route to the Orinoco without it? I still have the corner that shows the mine itself, declared Mr. Brewster, holding it for Biff to see, and Joe Nara would have to guide us there anyway. 
Biff's father frowned. We may have trouble getting through to the Orinoco if someone tries to block our way, but from there on it should be smooth sailing. Mr. Stannart says in his letter that he will bring his yacht to meet us on our way back and will sign the agreement with Nara then and there. Returning to their room, Biff and his father met the manager of the hotel hasting up the stairs. Mr. Brewster told him briefly that they had surprised a sneak thief in their room and handed over the intruder's revolver. With profuse apologies, the manager departed after Mr. Brewster refused his offer to have the room put in order. When they were alone, Biff's father said, It was neat, the way you disarmed that fellow. Where did you learn that trick? From Mr. Serbot, replied Biff, the man I met on the plane coming from Bellum. While they were repacking Mr. Brewster's bags and clearing up the room, Biff told his father about the things they discussed on the plane. Mr. Brewster listened intently, then asked, Did you tell Serbot that I was stopping at this hotel? Positively not, returned Biff. He couldn't possibly have learned it unless... Unless what? Unless he saw the envelope, exclaimed Biff in a hollow tone. It nearly worked out of my pocket while I was asleep. Mr. Serbot might have drawn it out that far. When I looked at him, though, he was asleep with his hands folded. Playing innocent, perhaps. Did he seem to make a habit of folding his hands? No, that was the only time I saw them folded. Dad, Biff's tone became worried. Do you think Mr. Serbot read the address on the envelope and phoned someone from the airport and told them to come up here? I wouldn't be surprised, his father asserted grimly. The envelope has the return address of the Ajax Mining Corporation, and that would identify us to anyone who is trying to beat us to the El Dorado mine. But let's not jump to conclusions just yet. Mr. Bruce had finished packing his bags. He picked them up and nodded for Biff to bring his too. We'll send these out to the airport, Mr. Brewster declared. There's a plane going up the Rio Negro at dawn, and our luggage can go on it. We may take that plane, or perhaps a later one. We'll see. They made arrangements with the hotel porter to handle the baggage. After that, Mr. Brewster decided they should go out for dinner so Biff could see the city. Once on the lighted streets of Manas, Biff realised how futile it would be to look for the baggily clad man who had stolen the map. Dozens of workmen who passed them were dressed in similar attire, even to a bandana worn as a neckerchief. The gay life of the tropical city impressed Biff. They were brilliantly lighted downtown cafes, and Mr. Brewster chose one where they were served half a dozen courses of tasty, highly seasoned food finishing with ice cream that Biff thought was the best he had ever eaten. He had just swallowed the last spoonful when he suddenly exclaimed, Look, Dad, those two men sitting at that table in the corner. One of them is Mr. Serbot. Mr. Brewster had no difficulty in picking out Serbot from Biff's earlier description, though the scar on the smiling man's cheek was scarcely visible in the soft light of the cafe. Serbot's companion was shorter and chunkier, with a broad face, quick narrow eyes, and straight lips. Introduce me on the way out, Mr. Brewster told Biff. I would like to size up that pair. A few minutes later, Biff's father was shaking hands with Serbot, who immediately introduced his stocky companion. This is Senhor Armandio, stated Serbot. Pepito Armandio, known as Grand Pepito, or Big Pepito, as you would call him in English. He is a famous wrestler. Smoothly, Serbot changed the subject. You have a very intelligent son, Senhor Brewster. I enjoyed my trip with him. You are interested in rubber, Senhor? What else, asked Mr. Brewster, would bring me to Manaus? Serbot's response was a noticeable increase of his perpetual smile. He bowed as he made the parting comment. Perhaps we have mutual interests, Senhor. Outside the cafe, Mr. Brewster spoke reflectively. Perhaps Serbot and I do have mutual interests, he said, in something bigger than rubber, something like gold. They climbed into the jeep and Mr. Brewster drove past the Amazonas Theatre, the magnificent opera house that had been built when Manaus was a boom town in the jungle. Mr. Brewster mentioned that to Biff as they went by, but Biff realised that his father was thinking of something else. Finally, he said, I'm not surprised that you suspected Serbot. He strikes me as being very shrewd. 
I am doubtful of his friend, Big Pepito, too. Then maybe Serbot sent Pepito to steal the map. Don't jump to conclusions too quickly, Biff. Mr. Brewster smiled as he spoke. I still can't understand how Serbot could have learned so much. Nobody knew my plans except Mr. Stannart. What about the directors of the Ajax Company, Dad? Once they agreed, they gave Stannart full say. Our dealings were confidential. Stannart sent me funds to buy safari equipment, which I shipped here to Manas ahead of me. Mr. Serbot talked about safaris on the plane trip. So you told me, Biff. Mr. Brewster frowned. I'm beginning to think that somebody found out about our plans here in Manus. Pepito, for instance, could have learned of the safari shipments and sent word to Sherbot. But Hal Whitman should have suspected something and informed me. Hal Whitman? Who is he, Dad? The man who received the shipments here. He assembled them secretly in a boathouse a few miles up the river. Later, he loaded all the supplies and took them far up the river to an old landing above Santa Isabel. He is waiting there for us to join him. Mr. Brewster halted the car at an intersection and pondered for a few moments. Then, he said, Somebody could have snooped around that boathouse after Whitman left. They might have learned where the shipments came from and perhaps gained some link between Whitman and myself. If we go out there, we might pick up some clue ourselves. It's worth a try. Mr. Brewster headed for the outskirts of the city. The road became rougher, and he was handling the jeep in its best puddle-jumping style, as he added, Maybe some spies are still around the boathouse, trying to learn what else they can. In that case, we can surprise them. If the boathouse is empty, we can wait inside it and see if anyone shows up later. As the jeep swung beneath an arch of trees, Biff was startled by what looked like human figures jumping from bough to bough in the glow of the moonlight. Mr. Brewster laughed. Just monkeys. Don't let them worry you. There is the boathouse. You can see our headlights reflected in its windows. Mr. Brewster cut off the headlights as he spoke, but oddly the reflection persisted for a few moments more. Biff thought it was his imagination but his father decided otherwise. Someone is moving around inside with a flashlight, he whispered. The boathouse is on pontoons to allow for the rise and fall of the river. If we reach the gangplank first, we can trap them before they come ashore. Silently, Biff and his father slipped out of the jeep and crept forward beneath the overhanging boughs that Biff could hear creak above him. This time he was thinking about people in the boathouse not monkeys in the trees. He was watching for a flashlight instead of looking up into the moonlight. That proved to be a bad mistake. Two living human figures dropped from the branches like massive rubber balls, one taking Biff as a target and the other squarely on Mr. Brewster. In their hands, these silent shadowy attackers carried thin ropes that they looped around the necks of their victims as they flattened them. Biff heard his father give a short, gurgling cry. Then Biff was gasping as the cord tightened around his own neck. Next, his captor clapped a cloth to his face, and Biff was stifled by a strong, pungent odour that completely overpowered him. His head seemed to burst with stabs of flashing light that turned to utter blackness as his senses left him. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Safari Starts. Thrum, 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 thrum. As Biff awakened, the steady sound made him think that he was back on the plain above the Amazon. He opened his eyes, expecting to see the yellow sea far below. Instead, he saw black water streaming past the side of a boat, churning white as it scudded back into the distance. When he turned his head, he saw his father beside him. They were propped against some boxes near the front of a long cabin cruiser, which had a permanent top 
stretched like a canopy over its large, open cockpit, making it ideal for tropical travel. But there was nothing ideal about Biff's present plight. Biff's hands were bound in back of him by a rough cord that chafed his wrists. His ankles, too, were tightly tied. At a glance, Biff saw that his father was in a similar situation. The thin, tough rope round Mr. Brewster's ankles looked like a tropical vine. Biff tried to speak, but he found his lips too dry, his throat too parched. He caught a warning head shake from his father, and following the direction of Mr. Brewster's gaze, Biff saw two chunky men, clad in baggy sleeveless shirts and old khaki trousers cut off at the knees. The pair were standing guard like patient watchdogs, looking for any move from the captives. They had black, straight hair and coppery skin. Those features, plus their stony, immobile expressions, marked them as Indians from the headwaters of the river, which, from its blackish colour, could only be the Rio Negro. One Indian spoke in a guttural dialect, and a shrill voice responded from up ahead. So, they're awake now. Good. Ego, you take the wheel. One Indian moved forward. Moments later, a scrawny man with a crafty, wizened face beneath a shock of whitish hair stepped into sight. To the other Indian, he piped, You be, you stay here. You help me watch. Then, tilting his head in bird-like fashion, the white-haired man studied the prisoners and demanded, What were you two doing around that boathouse? Mr. Brewster kept his lips tightly closed, his eyes staring straight back towards the frothy wake from the cruiser's propeller. Biff, too, ignored the question. Maybe you'd talk if I gave you a drink of water, the scrawny man suggested, and maybe I ought to toss you in that big drink out there, he gestured towards the river, and let you try to swim ashore. You wouldn't get far, tired like that. The stolid silence of the Brewsters annoyed the white-haired man. His voice rose to a still higher pitch. I mean it every word of it. I find a way to make you talk as sure as my name is Joe Nara. Biff almost gulped the name. Joe Nara? Before he caught himself. Then he heard his father speak calmly in reply. If you are really Joe Nara, stated Mr. Brewster, I'll tell you all you want to know. And I don't believe that you are Joe Nara. Oddly, the wizened man's anger faded. His own tone became even as he asked, And why wouldn't I be Joe Nara? Joe Nara is a husky chap, returned Mr. Brewster, with dark hair, a bit grey, but not white. He's tough, but he doesn't get angry and excited. He has too good a sense of humour. Biff saw a twinkle in the wizened man's eyes. The scrawny face relaxed in a genuine smile. In a soft, faraway tone, he asked, And who told you all that? Joe Nara's partner, Lou Kirby, before he died. So Lou is dead. I was afraid of that. As he spoke, the wizened man's expression became very sorrowful. He gestured to Yubi, and the Indian cut the crude ropes that bound the prisoners. I am Joe Nara, the white-haired man said. I've grown a lot older in the year since I saw Lou Kirby last. Kind of lost my sense of humour, too, living upriver with nobody but Indians to talk to. What's your name? Tom Brewster, and this is my son Biff. Mr Brewster extended his own hand, palm up. Old Joe Nara slapped his own hand palm downward, meeting Mr Brewster's with a solid whack followed by a tight grip, to which Mr. Brewster responded firmly. "'That's how Lou and I always shook hands,' declared Nara. "'I guess you and Lou were friends, all right, or he wouldn't have shown you that grip.' Ubi was bringing gourds of water. Nara waited until Biff and his father had slaked their thirst. Then, with a chuckle, the white-haired man remarked, "'I guess Lou must have told you about the time he and I went to Lake Titicaca down in Peru to look for Inca gold. No, Kirby never told me that, returned Mr. Brewster, because you never went there. He said you planned the trip but gave it up. You came up this way instead. And where would we have found gold near the headwaters of the Rio Negro? I can tell you in two words. El Dorado. That convinced Jonara. 
he opened a door beneath a short forward deck and revealed a compact kitchen galley. He heated up a pot of feijoda, a Brazilian dish of black beans cooked with dried meat. With it he served bowls of mandioca, a mush made from the pulp of the cassava. Simple though the fare was, it tasted so good that Biff eagerly accepted the second helping that Nara offered him. I was really hungry, said Biff. I feel as though I've been asleep for hours. You were, returned Nara. That stuff you inhaled is a secret Indian brew that acts like chloroform. Gives you an appetite, though, when you do wake up. And just why, asked Mr. Brewster dryly, did you happen to try the stuff out on us? I'll tell you why, asserted Nara. Every now and then I come down from the mine with Ego and Ubi to buy supplies. Whatever I buy, I pay for with these. From his pocket, Nara brought some small nuggets of pure gold, which clinked heavily when he trickled them from one hand to the other. People have been trying to trail me back up to the mine, continued Nara. So I bought this boat, the Znadu, from a rubber outfit that had gone broke. I decided to come down river to see who was spying on me. Before I even got to Santa Isabel, I saw a crew unloading supplies at an old abandoned camp. Whitman's crew, exclaimed Mr. Brewster. I sent them up the Rio Negro to wait for me so I could start on a safari to find your mine. Nada gave an understanding chuckle. I had Ego and Ubi talk to the natives, Nada said. They learned that the expedition had started from a boathouse outside of Manaus, so I came all the way down the river to look into it. We were watching the boathouse when you came along. So you thought we were enemies? Not exactly enemies, corrected Nara, just suspicious characters. After Ego and Ubi grabbed you, I decided to bring you along. Now that you've explained yourselves, I'll turn around and take you back down to Manus if you want. Now that we've started up river, decided Mr. Brewster, there is no need to go back. We sent our luggage on to Santa Isabel by air, and we intended to take a plane ourselves, but now we may as well keep on with you. All day, the Xanadu sped swiftly up the river Negro. Biff took his turn at the wheel and was pleased by the way the crews are handled. At intervals, the river became so thick with islands that it reminded Biff of the famous narrows that he had seen from the air above the lower Amazon. But here on the river Negro, the channels were shallow as well as twisty. Still, Biff found no difficulty in guiding the sleek craft through the maze. The Exandu was built to order for this river, Narrow told Biff. That's why I bought her. Be careful, though, when we reach that island dead ahead. The channel appears to split there. As Nara spoke, the palm-fringed island vanished. The whole sky had opened in one tremendous downpour. Biff couldn't believe that it was only rain. He thought for the moment that the Xandu had come beneath a tremendous waterfall. Adding to the illusion was the sudden rise of steam from the heated jungle that flanked the channel. Instantly the speeding cruiser was shrouded in a mist that swelled above it. Swing her about, shrilled Nara. Our only chance is to turn downstream before the flood hits us. Mr. Brewster stepped up and took the wheel. Instead of taking Nara's advice, he sped the boat straight upstream, picking his course in an amazing fashion. Somehow he must have gauged the exact position of the threatening island, for he veered past it. New channels seemed to open with each swerve of the cruiser's bow. Biff's father had seen Navy service in the South Pacific and was familiar with jungle waterways as well as tropical storms. As a lieutenant, junior grade, he had been trained specially for jungle fighting and won medals for bravery, finally leaving the service as a lieutenant commander. It's better to buck the current, Mr. Brewster declared, than let it carry us into something we can't avoid. Ego and Yubi were releasing curtains from beneath the permanent top, giving the cruiser's interior the effect of a long, narrow tent, completely sheltered from the terrific downpour, which, like many tropical rains, was coming straight downward. Some of the narrow channels were flooding rapidly, and there big logs and branches occasionally met the cruiser's rounded prow, only to glance aside as Mr. Brewster deftly turned the wheel. 
They reached a wider channel where a headland bulked suddenly in midstream, but it proved to be a small floating island composed of small palm trees sprouting from a mass of soil and undergrowth that had come loose from an overhanging bank. Biff could hear the chatter of monkeys and the screech of birds as the passing branches scraped the hanging canvas on the cruiser's side. Then the tiny islet and its excited living freight had drifted far downstream. Still Mr. Brewster kept steadily to his course, staring upstream through the cruiser's rain-swept windshield. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the rain ended, revealing a new maze of channels that could be found only by looking for gaps among the tree branches. So high had the water risen in this sunken area. Cutting the speed, Mr. Brewster navigated the openings gingerly. That brought a chuckle from Joe Nara. Kind of lucky, weren't you? he remarked. Yes, I was rather lucky, acknowledged Mr. Brewster. Like you and Lou Kirby when you stumbled onto that mine of yours. We were more than lucky, retorted Nara. We were smart. Didn't Lou tell you how we doped it out? He said you ran into a tribe of Indians who were guarding a mountain that they claimed was sacred. That's right. Way, way Indians. Ego and Yubi are members of the tribe. Nara gestured towards the stolid pair, who now were rolling up the canvas curtains. What else did Lou say? He said you convinced the Indians that you were a powerful witch doctor, so they led you to the lost mine. From the tricks I showed them, chuckled Nara, they thought I was El Dorado the original, and that the mine belonged to me and Lou. You know the story of the man who turned all golden. Well, I proved it could be done. Biff was hoping that Nara would give more details on that subject, when suddenly the white-haired man demanded, Did Lou give you a map to locate the mine? Not exactly, replied Mr. Brewster. He gave me one showing a route from the mine to some waterways which he said led to the Orinoco River. That was all. That was enough. It proved there was a short way out. Yes, but I still have to go over the actual route to make sure that gold ore could be transported by it down the Orinoco. Do you have the map with you now? Only part of it. From deep in his pocket, Mr. Brewster produced the torn corner from Kirby's map. A prowler stole the rest from my hotel room, he explained. I managed to hold on to the part that shows the mine. Joe Nara stroked his chin in a worried fashion. If somebody showed me the rest of the map, he commented, I might have to believe them if they said they knew Lou Kirby, too. I thought of that, returned Mr. Brewster calmly, and I would be glad if such a person should appear. It would be a case of a thief trapping himself. Joe Nara nodded as though he agreed, but he immediately dropped the subject of the map and the mine as well. During the next few days, the Xanadu thrummed up river, keeping to broad channels instead of short cuts between islands. This simplified the handling of the cruiser during brief but heavy rainstorms. Biff noted that after each rain, the air soon became as humid as before. It was hot at night as well as in the daytime, and while one member of the group piloted the cruiser under the bright tropical moon, the others slept in the ample cockpit never in the tiny forward cabin. One evening when Nara was at the wheel, Biff and his father were seated near the stern, far enough away for Biff to ask, Do you think Joe Nara doubts your story, Dan? About the map being stolen, returned Mr. Brewster. He might be wondering about it. After all, I could have torn the corner from a map that belonged to someone else. But you gave him Kirby's hand grip, and when you mentioned El Dorado, it was like a password. I could have learned those from some other person. Nara has to be cautious with a gold mine at stake. I think he trusts me, but wants to sound me out. Watch him, and you'll see he is suspicious of everything. Biff noted that, as the trip continued, Nara insisted upon giving other river craft a wide berth. When occasional airplanes flew high above, Nara always leaned out from beneath the canopy to study them suspiciously but the planes apparently took no notice of the boat below. 
After the cruiser had passed Santa Isabel, Biff was taking his turn at the wheel when Nara approached and remarked, Pretty soon we'll drop you and your dad at the old rubber camp where your friend Whitman is waiting for you. Aren't you going to join us on the safari? Not there, returned Nara. I'm taking the Xandu on to Sao Gabriel to see if we can buck the rapids and reach the upper river. Mr. Brewster had been close enough to hear Nara's comment. Now he put the query. Then where will we meet you, Joe? At Piedra del Cuchu, Nara replied. You can see it for miles, a big rock rising from the forest, where Brazil, Venezuela and Colombia all meet up. By the time you arrive there, we will know if it is safe to go on. Why wouldn't it be safe? asked Biff. Because of the makers, the headhunters who raid the river settlements. Nara turned to his two Indians and said, Tell them about the makers. Maku very bad, stated Igu. Maku kill for head, added Ubi. At last, the Xanadu reached an old dilapidated landing where half a dozen men stood beside some huts on the high bank. Mr. Brewster indicated one man who was wearing khaki shorts, white shirt, and pith helmet. That's Whitman, said Mr. Brewster. He was too far away to hail him. He brought out a leather case containing a flat metal mirror and handed it to Biff. Whitman understands Morse, Mr. Brewster said. Signal him to send out a boat for us, Biff. Biff turned the mirror towards the sun, then slanted it in Whitman's direction. Covering the mirror with his hand, he flashed the message in dots and dashes. S-E-N-D-B-O-A-T Whitman pointed to a canoe on the shore. Biff watched two figures hurry down and clamber into the craft, a small figure at the bow, a big one in the stern. They paddled out to the waiting cruiser and swung alongside. The man in the stern, a husky, barrel-chested native, furnished a broad, friendly smile. Me, Jacome, he announced. The bow paddler was an Indian boy about Biff's age and size. He was wearing faded blue denim trousers, ragged at the knees, and a shirt that matched it in colour and tattered sleeves. He reached up to grab the cruiser's side, adding, I'm Kamuka. Biff extended his own hand and responded, I'm Biff. In that unexpected handshake, the two boys established an immediate friendship. They grinned at each other as Biff helped Kamuka swing the canoe about so that Jacome could hold the stern alongside. As soon as Biff and his father stepped into the canoe, the Xandu sped off like a startled creature. Joe Nara at the wheel waved goodbye, while Ego and Ubi simply stared back like a pair of reversed figureheads. Jacome and Kamuka did fast work with their paddles to prevent the canoe from tipping in the cruiser's swell. Then they headed toward the dock. Kamuka looked over his shoulder and said to Biff, I like the way you send message. You show me how? Biff nodded. I'll show you how. During the short paddle, Mr. Brewster talked to Jacome in Portuguese, and Biff, listening closely, understood most of what was said. Mr. Brewster asked about the luggage and was told it had arrived by air. Also, he wanted to know if the safari was ready to start. Jacome told him, yes, that they had been waiting for him to arrive. When they reached the shore, Hal Whitman was still up by the huts, engaged with the natives in an excited conversation. Mr. Brewster started in that direction, and Biff was about to follow when a hand plucked his sleeve. It was Kamuka, with the request. You spell message now? All right, agreed Biff. He produced the mirror, caught the sun's glint, and focused it on the wall of a hut perhaps a hundred feet away. Now watch. Biff halted abruptly. A burly native, wearing baggy white shirt and trousers, with a red bandana tied about his head, had joined the argument and was pushing Mr. Whitman back into the hut. Arubu, exclaimed Kamuka. He make trouble. Whitman came from the hut with a shotgun and gestured for the native, Arubu, to be on his way. Instead, Arubu grabbed for the gun and snatched it from Whitman's grasp, tripping him at the same time. Mr. Brewster was starting forward on the run, but he was too far away to help Whitman. Arubu raised the gun butt to drive it down on Whitman's head. Biff could see the savage look on Arubu's face. Kamuka gripped Biff's arm. The native boy's voice was breathless. 
Somebody must help Mr. Whitman. Quick. End of chapter four. Chapter Five of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Spotted Terror. That jog from Kamuka's hand gave Biff a sudden idea. Biff was holding the mirror so it threw a big spot of sunlight on the hut wall. The spot wavered when Kamuka jogged Biff's arm, and Urubu was only a dozen feet from the corner of the hut. Biff changed the mirror's angle just a slight degree, spotting the light square in Urubu's eyes. That reflected glint of the sun was enough. Urubu dropped back, flinging his arm upward to shield his vision. Mr. Whitman came to his feet and grappled for the shotgun. A few seconds later, Mr. Brewster had pitched into the struggle. They disarmed Urubu, who stood by glaring suddenly. Biff and Kamuka approached the group, and Jacome, who had pulled the canoe on shore, came up behind them. "'You know what the name Urubu means?' Biff Kamuka asked. Biff shook his head. "'It means vulture,' the Indian boy said. A chuckle came from Jacome. "'A good name for Urubu. He is like one vulture.' At close range, Urubu looked the part. He had a profile like a buzzard's. He stood by, a sullen look on his face, as Mr. Whitman told Mr. Brewster. I turned down Arubu as a guide because he lied to me. He said he had guided safaris for the past five years, when part of that time he was in jail. Then he told our porters that I lied to them. You did put in Urubu. You said that Senor Brewster would arrive three days ago. Instead, he has arrived only now, as you can see. Arubu repeated those remarks to the native bearers in a mixture of Portuguese and Indian dialect. He was dumbfounded when Mr. Brewster spoke to them in the same manner. Mr. Brewster's words brought a murmur of approval. They want to be paid for the days they waited, Mr. Brewster told Mr. Whitman. I said we would pay them, and they are satisfied. Do you need Arubu as a guide? I should say not. Then we can send him away again. That was unnecessary. When Mr. Brewster turned to speak to Urubu, the troublemaker was gone. He had made a quick departure by the nearest jungle path. Mr. Whitman promptly called for Luis, the new guide, to step forward, and a small, bowing native came from the group of bearers. Since it was not yet noon, Mr. Brewster ordered Luis to get everything ready for an immediate start. Soon the native bearers, more than a dozen in number, were hoisting their packs and other equipment. Meanwhile, Biff was present at a last-minute conference between his father and Hal Whitman. "'We'll follow our original plan,' stated Mr. Brewster. "'If we strike off to the northwest and follow the regular trails, we will appear to be looking for Balata, like any other rubber-hunting expedition.' Biff knew that the term the latter referred both to the rubber tree and its juice. He watched Hal Whitman mop perspiration from his forehead. Whitman's worry seemed to vanish with that process. We will be following the long side of a triangle, Biff's father continued, while Joe Nara is going around by the Rio Negro, turning north after he passes Sao Gabriel, so we know exactly where to meet him. That will be at Piedra del Cuchay. That's better than floundering around the headwaters of the Rio Negro, Whitman agreed. I was afraid we would be on a wild goose chase trying to find him there. It's lucky you met up with Nara. Let's say Nara met up with us, Mr. Brewster chuckled. We'll meet again at Piedra del Cruce, providing Nara dodges those headhunters. Since the rapids will delay him, we should reach the great rock as soon as Nara does. I'll talk to Luis and see if he knows the best route. Not yet, warned Mr. Brewster. Wait until we are deep in the jungle, with no chance of any spies being about, before we even mention Piedra del Cuchu. Do you understand? The final query was meant for Biff as well as Mr. Whitman. Biff nodded, then went to join Kamuka who was waiting to help him get his pack on his back. That done, they fell into the procession as it started out. 
The first few miles gave Biff the false impression that a jungle trek was easy. The trail was smooth, well trodden by multitudes of natives who had scoured the back country in search of Balata. But as paths diverged, they became rougher. Biff began stumbling over big roots that crossed the path, and when he kept his eyes turned down to watch for them, he lost sight of the bearers ahead of him and had trouble getting into line behind them. Once, Biff lost the trail entirely, and Kamuka overtook him just as he was blundering squarely into a fallen tree. The obstacle was at shoulder level, and Kamuka, sighting the bearers taking a turn in the path beyond, suggested, We climb over, take short way back to trail. Biff pressed aside some projecting branches as he clambered across the tree trunk, pack and all. His hands became sticky with some clinging substance. Spider web, thick here, Kamuka said. He helped Biff brush away the fine spun threads and pointed into the sunlight that filtered through the jungle foliage. Glistening between the tree branches were the largest, thickest spider webs that Biff had ever seen. There were multitudes of them forming what at first glance seemed to be an impassable barrier. Kamuka settled that problem by clearing away the obstructing branches with hard, expert slashes of his machete, taking the webs with them. The trail had become so irregular that the bearers frequently had to hack their way through the thick growth. Kamuka did the same, and Biff tried to copy the Indian youth's smooth style. Kamuka handled his machete easily, despite the pack that he carried. But with Biff, the pack shifted at every swing, and its strap cut into his back and shoulders. Big Jacome was doing most of the trailblazing, with Kamuka close behind him. Mr. Brewster and Mr. Whitman did their share, while urging the bearers to take their turns at the work. All responded willingly, with the exception of the guide, Louise, who was lagging behind. "'What's holding you back, Louise?' Whitman demanded. "'Why don't you get up ahead and take a hand at cutting the trail?' "'You pay others to cut trail, senor,' returned Louise. "'You pay me to be guide, no?' Biff's father overheard the argument and provided a prompt solution. Since you are the guide, he told Lewis, suppose you show us the trail. Possibly we have lost it. You lead, we will follow. Mr. Brewster spoke in the Brazilian dialect that the bearers understood. Their solemn faces broadened at the expense of Lewis. Angrily, the undersized guide shouldered his way to the head of the line and began hacking at the brush with Jacome. Biff caught up with Kamuka, who had waited while Lewis went by. You see his face? asked Kamuka. Louise is very mad. He does not like hard work. The glower that Louise gave over his shoulder proved that Kamuka's opinion was correct. The keen-eyed Indian boy was quick to note that Biff's face also wore a pained expression, but for a different reason. Understandingly, Kamuka said, You have trouble with pack? I fix it. Expertly, he adjusted the straps to the fraction of an inch. From then on, the pack seemed to fit to Biff's back, giving him no more aches. What amazed Biff, though, was the fact that Kamuka's pack had no straps, but was laced to his back by crude ropes made from jungle vines. Yet it seemed to adjust itself to every move that Kamuka made. Soon the going became easier underfoot, and the path was free of obstacles. It was no longer necessary to hack through the jungle growth. Louise, bring us back to better trail, Kamuka confided to Biff. Less work for Louise. It was less work for Biff, too, though he didn't say so. He was pleased because his father had handled the situation so neatly. Biff noted the happy grins on the faces of the bearers every time Mr. Brewster moved back and forth among them. Biff grinned too when his dad came by and gave him an encouraging whack on the pack which now seemed moulded to Biff's body. It takes a few days to get into the swing of a safari, Mr Brewster stated, so don't be discouraged. Even the native bearers are struggling a bit, though they won't admit it. We'll call it a day as soon as we reach a suitable campsite. 
About an hour later, the safari halted. Gratefully, the bearers eased their packs to the ground and began to set up camp at Whitman's direction on a high bank above a jungle stream. The insects were bothersome as they had been at intervals along the route, but the expedition was equipped to meet that problem. The packs contained netting for the sleeping hammocks as well as insect repellent. The chief feature of the campsite was its closeness to a waterhole. Louise approved this, making a great show of his official title of guide. Biff, glad to be free of his pack, eagerly volunteered to help Kamuka bring up pails of water from the stream below. Halfway down, Kamuka hissed for a quick halt. We go back up quick, he said to Biff. We tell Senor Brewster that we see Tapir at Waterhole. Kamuka pointed at a pair of curious dark brown animals with clumsy bulky bodies, stocky legs and long snouted heads. The creatures were feeding on the leaves of young trees and appeared somewhat tame. Kamuka took no chance on frightening them away, however, as he beckoned Biff up the path. Mr. Brewster promptly picked up a loaded rifle and accompanied the boys down the path. The tapirs were already lumbering into the brush when Biff's father took quick but accurate aim on one of the animals and fired. One tapir dropped in its tracks while its companion crashed madly into the jungle. The boys rushed down to the bank and found that the tapir was shot squarely through the head. When Mr. Brewster joined them, he smiled. That's the only way to shoot a tapir, he declared. Otherwise, they blunder into the jungle wounded, and you can never find them. They have thick hides like a hippopotamus. In fact, they belong to the same family. That night, the members of the safari feasted on tapir steaks, which they broiled on the prongs of long forked sticks. Later they went to sleep around the same campfire. All day Biff had listened to the chatter of monkeys and the screech of birds. Now howls of jungle animals seemed tuned to the heavy basso chorus of frogs from the stream below. But despite that, Biff was soon sound asleep, the crackle of the campfire blending with his last waking moments. Some hours later he woke up suddenly. The jungle concert had ended, and the flames had settled to a low, subdued flicker. Somebody should have tended the fire, Biff thought. He recalled his father discussing that point with Louis shortly after they had finished dinner. Biff rolled from his hammock and groped towards some logs that lay beside the fire. There he halted at sight of what appeared to be two live coals glinting from a big log. Biff pulled back his hand just in time as the log came alive with a snarl. Biff realised that he'd encountered some prowling beast of prey. He raised the alarm with a loud shout. Dad, there's something here by the fire. Before Biff could complete the sentence, he saw that the creature was a huge jungle cat, its tawny yellow coat spotted black. Already it was poising for a spring. Biff, caught unarmed, was confronted by an attacking jaguar, one of the jungle's most ferocious killers. Biff heard an answering call from his father, then before Mr. Brewster could have possibly found time to grab his gun, the jaguar sprang. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 6 Into the Quicksand Biff flung his arms upward as he tried to duck away. It was a hopeless effort, for nothing could have saved him from those fierce claws once the jaguar reached him. What stopped the springing jungle cat was another figure, small but chunky, that came flying out of the darkness, feet first. It was Kamuka. The Indian boy had grabbed the long liana vine hanging like a rope from a tree beside his high hammock. All in one motion, he had swung himself across the jaguar's path, just in time to ram the creature's shoulder in mid-air and veer the big cat towards the fire. That gave Biff time enough to roll the other way, and Kamuka, as he struck the ground, promptly squirmed about to dive off into the darkness. The scene was momentarily illuminated by a shower of sparks raised by the jaguar when it struck the fringe of the embers. With more of a yell than a snarl, the big cat cleared the fire at a single bound and took off into the jungle. 
Mr. Brewster had his gun by then, but with so many figures bouncing in the vague firelight, he couldn't risk a shot. By the time Biff and Kamuka were out of the way, Jacome had come on the scene, swinging a big club. Mr. Brewster had to wait until he was out of the path of aim before firing into the jungle. By then, Mr. Brewster might as well have fired blank shots. The jaguar had vanished completely in darkness. Jacome threw some logs on the fire, and as the flames took hold, he commented, The Tapir Tiger, that is what we call the jaguar, a good name for him. Look there and you see why. Jacome indicated the chunk of cooked tapir meat hanging from a tree branch near the fire. The smell of its favourite food had evidently drawn the tapir tiger in from the jungle, but that did not fully satisfy Mr. Brewster. Jaguars frequently kill and eat tapirs, Biff's father declared, but they also shy away from campfires. I gave orders that this fire should be tended all night. Who neglected his duty? The final words were addressed to Louis, who had just joined the group. The guide shrugged and gestured to some of the native bearers who were coming sleepily from their hammocks. They stared dumbly at Louis until Mr. Brewster queried them sharply in their dialect, getting head shakes from all. I will give the orders direct from now on, Mr. Brewster told Louis bluntly, and I intend to see that they are carried out. He looked up, noted the faint glimmer of daybreak through the high leaves, and added, It is after dawn. Let's break camp and start on our way. Biff expressed his thanks to Kamuka while the Indian boy was helping him prepare his pack. If you hadn't hopped to help me the way you did, asserted Biff, I would be just a chunk of tapir meat, or something a lot like it. I'll remember what you did for me, Kamuka. That is good, rejoined Kamuka solemnly. I help you, you help me. That is the way in the jungle. Biff felt he was getting the knack of jungle ways during that day's trek, but he was due for new surprises. As they had to pass through a thick growth of brush, he heard a sound that was sharply distinct from the screeches of the vivid parrots and macaws that continually scolded from the trees. It was exactly like a hammer striking an anvil or some other chunk of solid metal. It came from well back in the jungle, and after it was repeated, Biff said to Kamuka, "'Hear that? There must be a village back there in the jungle.' Kamuka laughed, as the clanging sound came again. El Campanero, he defined. That is what some people call it. Others call it the bellbird. You mean it's only a bird? As if in answer, the sharp note was repeated with methodical precision, and Biff recognized that it had a quality that could be mistaken for a bell rather than the clank of hammer on anvil. Biff kept looking for the bird itself until Kamuka noticed it and told him, Bell bird very hard to find. He may be far away when you think he is close by. Other creatures were closer at hand. From up ahead, Jacome turned and pointed to the path. He called something in his native tongue, and Biff watched the bearers take quick sidesteps. Then Kamuka was nudging Biff with his elbow and pointing out the reason. A procession of ants was moving along the trail as though keeping pace with the safari. The insects were carrying thin green slivers that wobbled above their bodies. Biff saw that those were tiny fragments of leaves that the ants had gathered and evidently were going to store for food. Umbrella ants, defined Kamuka. Be careful or they crawl up your leg instead of a long path. Umbrella ants can bite hard. From the way the ants had chopped the leaves they carried, Biff took Kamuka at his word. He played hopscotch with the insects until they veered off the trail. The going became easy again, except that the atmosphere of the jungle was growing more humid. Even the chatter of the birds and monkeys was silenced in the sultry calm. Then came a sudden rain as torrential as the big downpour that they had encountered on the Rio Negro. With the jungle steam rising about them, it was a case of groping along the trail, which soon became ankle-deep with water. As he sloshed through the muck, Biff told Kamuka, Those ants are smarter than we are. They must have known this was coming and carried their own umbrellas. Kamuka interpreted that to Jacome, who laughed and passed it along to the bearers. 
The rain stopped suddenly at last, but although the heat returned again, the path remained soggy underfoot. Louise, it seemed, had lost the trail during the rain and was marching the safari into a jungle swamp. Mr. Brewster called a halt. It was not just a matter of getting back on the trail. He wanted the best trail. For the first time, Biff heard his father mention Piedra del Cruchai to Luis, who nodded that he understood. We go to Piedra del Cruchai, assured Luis. That is easy, now I know. I show you the best way. Biff's clothes were dry by now except for his shoes and socks, which felt as if they were filled with lead weights as the march was resumed. Luis soon took the safari out of the swampy land to a dry path, but at times he showed hesitancy at places where the trail divided. Always he came finally to a definite decision, but Jacome began to eye him suspiciously. We all hear Senor Brewster say we go to Piedra del Cruchai, Jacome confided to Biff and Kamuka. Now we know we go there, Luis is afraid to take us on wrong trail. Some of us go to Piedra de Cruce before this. We may remember way if Luis forget it. A little later, Biff fell in stride alongside his dad and told him what Jacome had said. I think there's no question but that Luis is trying to delay us, declared Mr. Brewster. The only puzzle is his purpose. He may simply be hoping to make more money by keeping us longer on the hike or he may have deliberately stalled us in order to learn our exact destination. That is why I told him. Now I am forcing him to show his hand. Mr. Brewster's tactics paid off by mid-afternoon. The ringing cry of the bellbird had begun again in the deep jungle, and Biff was still hoping for a sight of the elusive Campanero when Luis led the safari on a short side trail that terminated in a clearing. There, Louise announced, we camp here tonight. We could still go on a few miles farther, objected Mr. Brewster. In fact, we might stop almost anywhere on the trail. Plenty of water here, argued Louise, maybe not in other places. Jacome overheard that. The big man supplied a grim but knowing grin as he muttered his own opinion to the boys. Maybe and maybe not, said Jacome. In wet season we find water everywhere. In dry season, no, but we came through a big rain today, like wet season. After brief deliberation, Mr. Brewster gave Louise the nod. We need water, he agreed, and perhaps we are too tired to go on much farther today. We will make camp here. Hardly had they unloaded their packs before Kamuka suggested to Biff, Come with me, maybe we find Bellbird. They started along a twisty jungle path in the general direction of the distant metallic sound. Kamuka was moving so hurriedly that they were out of sight of camp before Biff caught up with him and reminded him, they may want to send us for water back at camp. That can wait, put in Kamuka. We find bird first. But you told me that there was no use looking for the bellbird, that the sound might be far away. I know, but this is not real bellbird. Listen. Biff listened. The sharp note came clear again, from exactly the same direction. Biff could detect no difference between it and the anvil chorus of earlier in the day. But Kamuka could. Somebody is hitting metal with hammer, the Indian boy insisted. We look for them. We find them, if we hurry. Kamuka waved his arm for Biff to follow, as he started a quick jog along the jungle path, hoping to reach the source of the well-faked bird call before the sound ceased. Straight ahead, low tree branches formed a thick green arch, darkening the path between two low banks that were vivid with colourful flowers. Mostly they were magnificent orchids that thrived on dampness as well as heat, but Biff was unaware of that. Kamuka, though schooled in jungle knowledge, ignored the flowers in his haste. He had turned his head to see if Biff had responded to his call, when suddenly the green carpeting of the path gave way beneath his weight. A moment later, Kamuka was waist-deep in slimy ooze, squirming, twisting about to grab at bushes on the solid ground that he had left. The tufts of grass that he clutched simply pulled loose from the soft earth. With each quickly repeated snatch, he had still less chance of gaining a hold, for he was sinking to his armpits as he panted, Look out, Biff! Don't come close! Quick, Sand!
End of chapter 6「Seven of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 7. The Deadly Coils Biff stopped a dozen feet short of the spot where Kamuka, arms emerging from the mire, was frantically waving him back. Biff felt the soft bank giving way beneath him, and he immediately sprang back to solid ground, knowing that only from there could he hope to save his friend. Kamuka was still sinking in the quicksand, though more slowly now. That gave Biff a few more minutes in which to help him, but how to help was still a question. There was no use throwing a liana vine to Kamuka. It would be too flimsy. A tree branch would be better, but the only boughs strong enough to support a person's weight were those that overhung the mire itself. Biff couldn't wrench those branches loose from their trunks in time to save Kamuka. In fact, to push anything out from the bank looked like a hopeless plan. The best way to help would be by a pull straight up. Biff realized that when he saw Kamuka look up towards the lowest bough, six feet or more above his head. If only Kamuka could reach that far. That thought gave Biff the answer. Skirting the quicksand, he climbed one of the trees and started working out on its lowest thick branch, hand over hand, towards the spot where Kamuka, now nearly shoulder deep in the muck, still looked up hopefully. So far, Biff had been worrying whether the bow would prove strong enough. Now he was wishing that it would bend more. Biff was dangling near Kamuka, but not quite above him, and it was impossible for the Indian boy to shift his position in the quicksand but Biff was able to do the next best thing. Locking his hands over the thick branch, Biff began a pendulum swing, out and back, out and back, bringing his ankles closer to Kamuka's reach. Kamuka made one clutch and missed, but on the next swing Biff practically placed his ankle in the Indian boy's grasp. Kamuka caught Biff's other ankle in the same fashion, and Biff, slanting a glance downwards, saw the other boy's face smiling grimly from between those upstretched arms. Kamuka's voice came calmly. Hold tight, Biff. I will pull up slowly. Now Biff was glad that the bow was a stout one, for he could feel it give under Kamuka's added weight. Biff tried to work himself higher by bending his arms and turning them along the branch, so that he could use his hands to grip his opposite wrists. That helped at first, but Kamuka's weight kept increasing as he emerged gradually from the ooze, and the strain made Biff's shoulders feel as if they would pull from their sockets. But by then Kamuka had worked clear of the quicksand suction. He caught Biff's belt with one hand, then the other. Next he was clamping Biff's shoulder and finally the tree branch. The strain lessened then, with both boys dangling from the bow. Practically side by side, they made a hand-over-hand -hand trip toward the tree trunk and dropped to solid ground. There they sat a moment, panting and rubbing their shoulders as they looked at each other, a bit bewildered by their short but strenuous adventure. From the distance came that clear, metallic note that they had heard before. Kamuka looked at Biff. We still go find it, maybe? All right, Kamuka, let's go find it. They skirted the quitsand and took the path that Kamuka had missed in his hurry. It divided into lesser paths, but they continued to pick a course in the general direction of the clanging sound. Somebody use that for a signal, declared Kamuka. When we find it, you will see that I am right. You are right, Biff whispered. Look there. A figure had cut into the path well ahead of them and was continuing on. Softly, Kamuka whispered the name, Luiz. The boys were fortunate. Luiz hadn't spotted them. Evidently, the guide had left the camp by another path and had followed a roundabout course to reach his present goal. Luiz, judging by the eager expression on his scheming face, was also following the call of the false bellbird. Cautiously, the boys took up Louis's trail until he reached a clearing. There they sidled into a patch of jungle and spread the foliage just enough to view the open space in front of them. A big man was sitting on a camp stool beside a tent. 
In front of him was a small anvil, and he gave it a ringing stroke with a hammer as the boys watched. Kamuka was the first to recognize the hawkish face that turned in Luiz's direction as the guide approached. Kamuka whispered, Arubu. Biff had scarcely noticed Arubu. Instead, he was staring in total amazement at two other men who had come from the tent. One of those men is Nicholas Serbot, he told Kamuka. The other is his sidekick, Big Pepito. But they were in Manus the night we left there. How did they get here? Airplane come up river ahead of you, replied Kamuka. Stop at Maloka, near rubber camp. By Maloka, Kamuku meant a native village some distance back from the Rio Negro. Quickly, Biff exclaimed, That's where they met Arubu. They must have paid him to make trouble for us. Kamuka gave a chuckle. Look like they pay Luis too. Arubu was introducing Luis to Serbot and Pepito. In the background were several native bearers, apparently under orders to keep their distance. Serbot and Pepito were watching them to make sure they did. Biff took advantage of that. We can move up closer, he told Kamuka. May be close enough to hear what they are saying. Kamuka silently agreed, for he crawled along with Biff until they reached the very fringe of the thinner brush, only a dozen yards from where the four men stood. There Kamuka whispered, It's far enough. The grass here was tall and studded with brilliant flowers and shrubs that had cropped up since the brush was thinned. By keeping almost flat on their stomachs, the boys remained completely hidden. Most of the discussion was in Portuguese with a sprinkling of dialect, so between them Biff and Kamuka were able to understand most of what was said. I come for money, Senor, Luis told Serbot, like Arubu said you would give me if I delay safari. You will get your money later, promised Serbot. You can't spend it here in the jungle anyway. If you even showed it, Brewster and Whitman would wonder where it came from. Louise started to babble an objection, only to have Arubu interrupt him. You have only done half your job, Louise, Arubu reminded him. You gave our safari time to catch up with yours. Now you must see that we have time to get ahead. For that, injected Louise, I should be paid double. You will be, agreed Serbot, if you can tell us where Brewster intends to go, so we can get there ahead of him. Biff saw Louise's teeth gleam in a knowing smile. The small guide spoke in dialect to Arubu, who made a prompt reply. Kamuka understood the talk and whispered to Biff, Louis says he can tell them what they want to know. He asks Arubu if he can trust them. Arubu says yes. By then, Louis had turned to Serbot. Biff's heart sank as he heard Louis triumphantly announce, They go to Piedra del Cruchai. The big boundary rock, exclaimed Serbot. That must have been Nara's boat that took Brewster and the boy up the river. Now they probably plan to meet Nara there. He turned to Urubu. Can you get us to Piedra del Cruchai first? he demanded. Easily, assured Urubu, if Luis takes them the long way. Maybe I should leave them, put in Luis, and come with you. Then they will have no guide who will not find the way at all. That would be all right, decided Serbot, but learn what else you can first. Did Brewster mention the name Nara? Naya, senor. Did he say anything about a map? Naya, senor. Find out what you can about both. If you can get word to us, good. If Brewster becomes suspicious, join us. But your big job is to delay their safari. Use whatever way seems best. That ended the parley, except for parting words from Yorubu to Louis, which greatly interested the listening boys. Tomorrow I signal before we start, Arubu gestured towards Hammer and Anvil. If you do not come to join us, we will know you are staying with the safari to guide them the long way. Arubu and Louis were turning in the direction of the spot where the boys lay hidden. Biff whispered to Kamuka, Let's crawl out of here fast. Stay still. Kamuka's interruption came as a warning hiss. Do not move. Not one inch. Biff let his eyes turn in the direction of Kamuka's stare. Despite the intense heat of the jungle, Biff could actually feel himself freeze. Coming straight toward them through the tall grass was the head of a huge snake. Behind it, the grass rippled from the slithering coils that followed. 
Fully twenty feet in length, the gigantic creature could only be an anaconda, greatest of all boa constrictors. To be caught within those crushing coils would mean sure death. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 8 A Traitor Strikes Do not move, not one inch. Kamuka repeated that warning as the snake's long body slid slowly past. Whether or not the creature was in search of other prey, to move would be to attract it. Biff realized that from Kamuka's tone as well as his words. Gradually the sliding coil slackened speed. It was Biff who spoke now, his own voice strained, but low. It's turning now, Kamuka. It may be coming back. Maybe, but stay still. One move, you are gone. Despite himself, Biff raised his head, only slightly, but enough to look beyond the long hose-like body that was still gliding by. Aloud, Biff groaned. There is Luiz, coming straight toward us. Biff threw up his arms to ward off the great boa's tail as it lashed past. Looking up, he saw the snake's huge mouth yawning toward him. Biff shut his eyes, thinking there was no hope now. Then a wild scream came from just ahead. Biff and Kamuka bobbed up from the grass and saw what had happened. The anaconda on the road for prey had lashed out for the first moving thing that approached it, Luiz. Caught in the snake's coils, the guide was shouting, Arubu, a judo, a judo. Arubu took one quick look around and relayed the call for help. Serbot and Pepito came from the tent, saw what was happening, and dashed back for their guns. Biff didn't wait to watch what followed. He grabbed Kamuka's arm and exclaimed, Let's go! They went. Behind them they heard a burst of gunfire. Those first shots must have wounded the anaconda or frightened it away, for the next volley whistled through the foliage as Biff and Kamuka dived into the jungle. The boys found their path and raced along it until the shooting dwindled far behind them. Breathless, they slackened their pace to a walk and talked over what had happened. In a worried tone, Biff said, They must have seen us or they wouldn't have fired after us. I hope they didn't know who we were. More likely, observed Kamuka seriously, I think they don't know what we were. You mean they mistook us for some jungle animals? Why not? We were gone quick. Poof! Maybe we were gone quicker than Securia. By Securia, Kamuku meant the anaconda. He was referring to the giant water boa by its more popular Brazilian name. Kamuka's comment brought a smile from Biff. I wonder if they shot the anaconda, he speculated, or whether it managed to get away. Perhaps Luiz will tell us, rejoined Kamuka, grinning, when he gets back to our camp. If Luiz ever gets back there at all. The boys lost no time in getting back to camp themselves. There they told Mr. Brewster and Mr. Whitman all that had happened. Serbot must have learned a lot from somebody down in Minas Gerais, decided Mr. Brewster, though how I can't quite understand. I checked everyone who had talked with Lou Kirby, and I felt sure he had confided in me alone. And how did Serbot hear about Joe Nara? queried Mr. Whitman. There have been rumours of headhunters and abandoned rubber plantations off in the jungle. But no talk of prospectors and gold mines, at least none that reached me. There were rumours farther up the river, Biff's father said, according to what Nara told us. When Joe bought that cruiser and came down to Manaus, he turned rumour into fact. Nara found out about us, how Whitman pointed out, so why shouldn't Serbot find out about Nara, or about us for that matter? We know now where the leak came, through Yorubu. Mr. Brewster weighed that statement, then slowly shook his head. Urubu couldn't have sent word to Serbot that fast, he declared. Then turning to Biff, he queried, 
You are sure Serbot told Luis to find out what he could about Nara? Yes, replied Biff, and about the map, too. Then it wasn't Serbot's man who stole the map, mused Mr. Brewster, unless he wants that missing corner that I still have. Or else, Mr. Brewster interrupted himself as sounds of excitement came from the bearers, who were busy thatching palm leaves to form a shelter. Their babble of dialect included the name Luiz, and a couple of the bearers were running to help the guide as he came limping into camp. Say nothing, warned Mr. Brewster. Just listen to what Luiz has to tell us. Luiz had plenty to tell when they formed a sympathetic group around him. I look for Waterhole, Luis told them, and I meet Una Grande Securia, one big anaconda. He grabbed me round my body, like this. Graphically, Luis gestured to indicate how the snake's coiled had encircled his body. Biff and Kamuka kept straight, solemn faces as Luis continued. I pull my gun quick. Luis thrust his hand deep in his trouser pocket and brought out a small revolver. I fire quick until the gun is empty. He clicked the trigger repeatedly, then broke open the revolver and showed its empty chambers. Still, Anaconda hold me until I draw the knife and stab him hard. From a sheath at the back of his belt, Luis whipped out a knife that looked far more formidable than his puny gun. He gave fierce stabs at the imaginary Anaconda, his face gleaming with an ugly smile that was more vicious than triumphant. Luis looked like a small edition of Yorubu, whose ways he seemed to copy. Big snake go off into jungle, added Luis, wiggling his hand ahead of him to indicate the anaconda's writhing course. Hurt bad, I think. Maybe it is dead by now, but the animals were still afraid of it. I hear them run. His sharp eyes darted from Biff to Kamuka, but neither boy changed expression. Clumsily, Luiz pocketed the revolver with his left hand and thrust the knife smoothly back into its sheath with his right. He rubbed his side painfully, then beckoned to two of the natives and said, We go look for Waterhole again. A short while later, the boys had a chance to exchange comments while they were gathering palm fronds for the shelter. After making sure that no one else was nearby, Kamuka confided, Luis had no gun at start of safari. Arubu must have given gun to him. To explain the shots if any of our party heard them, exclaimed Biff. And did you see the way Luis looked at us when he mentioned scared animals? Maybe they glimpsed us going into the brush. Maybe, agreed Kamuka. I think they shoot anaconda or big securia would not let Luis go so easy. That's another reason why Luis claimed he shot it, added Biff. We might come across the anaconda and find the bullet marks. Shortly afterward, the boys found a chance to repeat those opinions to Mr. Brewster, who added a few points that they had overlooked. Luis couldn't possibly have brought the gun from his pocket, as he claimed, stated Mr. Brewster, because the snake was already coiled about his body. For that matter, he could not have drawn his knife either. However, from the clumsy way he showed us his gun and put it back in the wrong pocket, you could tell he had never handled it before. In contrast, he was smooth and quick with his knife, which is obviously his customary weapon. One question still perplexed Biff. That other cam is a good way off, Dad, Biff said. Yet we heard the anvil strokes before we started out. How come you didn't hear the gunfire later? Arubu may have made the first strokes closer by, replied Mr. Brewster. The anvil sound is also sharper than a gunshot, and should carry farther. That is probably why they chose it as a signal. Kamuka did well to detect it. That evening, Biff was glad there had been time to build the thatched shelter, for a tropical dew had begun to settle, almost as thick as a dripping rain. It was less damp beneath the shelter where Biff and Kamuka had slung their hammocks. Mr. Brewster, however, had inflated a rubber mattress and had placed it near the fire, stating that he would use a poncho to keep off the moisture. From his hammock, Biff watched his dad arrange small logs and palm stalks as spare fuel. As he closed his eyes, Biff could hear his father talking to Luis, who was standing close by. 
I will watch the fire tonight, announced Mr. Brewster. You have been hurt. You need rest more than I do. But, senor, objected Louis, suppose you fall asleep. I am sure to wake up at intervals. I always do. But you must get some sleep, Louis. You need to guide us to Piedra del Cruchay. You are sure you know the way? Most certainly, senor. But it may take longer than you expect. A pause. Then Mr. Brewster asked bluntly, Why? Because the shortest way is not the best way, returned Louis. We might meet floods or streams where the piranha may attack us. They are very dangerous fish, the piranha. I know, interrupted Mr. Brewster impatiently, but we have no time to waste. You are meeting someone at Piedra del Cruchay? Yes, replied Mr. Brewster, a man named... He caught himself, then said in a blunt tone, I won't know our plans until we get there. We will continue on up the river. That is all I can tell you. Don't you have a map, Senor? Biff opened his eyes at Louis' question. He saw his father start to reach into his inside pocket, then bring his hand out empty. Shaking his head, Mr. Brewster said, No, I have no map. Go get some sleep, Louis. You will need it. Biff glimpsed Louis's face as the sneaky guide turned from the firelight. Beneath the hat brim, Louis wore that same ugly smile that showed his satisfaction. Obviously, Louis was planning his next move, probably for tomorrow. When it came, his father would be ready for it, Biff felt sure. Soon Biff drifted into a fitful sleep from which he awoke at intervals. Sometimes he heard the crackle of the fire and decided that his father must have thrown on a log and then gone back to sleep. For, each time, Biff saw the figure of Mr. Brewster covered by the rubber poncho near the pile of logs that had become much smaller during the night. It must have been the fourth or fifth awakening when Biff saw someone move into the firelight's flicker. It was Louise. He crept forward. Crouched above the quiet form, Louis thrust his hand downward as if to reach into the sleeper's pocket. The figure under the poncho seemed to stir. Louis recoiled quickly and sped his hand to his hip. Before Biff could shout a warning, Louis had whipped out his long knife into sight and driven it straight down at the helpless shape beneath him. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Brazilian Gold Mine Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter Nine: The Shrunken Heads. Wildly, Biff tumbled from his hammock to the soggy ground. Coming to his hands and knees, he started forward just as another figure sprang into the firelight, too late to halt Louis's knife. The newcomer grabbed Louise's shoulders and spun the little man full about. For a moment, Louise poised his blade as though planning to counter the attack. Instead, he uttered an unearthly streak, as though he had seen a ghost. Biff was startled too, but his cry was a glad one. Etched against the firelight, Biff saw his dad's face looking down at Louise. Tom Brewster himself was the man who had interrupted Louise's deadly work. The figure under the poncho, Biff realized, must be a dummy. As the two men struggled for possession of the knife, they kicked the dummy apart with their feet. Suddenly, Louise managed to wrench free and dashed off into the jungle. Mr. Brewster didn't bother to start after the terrified guide. But Hal Whitman came rushing from the shelter waving a revolver. Mr. Whitman fired a few wild shots in the direction that Louise had taken. The crackling of the jungle plants came back like echoes, indicating that the gunfire had spurred Louise's mad flight. That's enough, Hal, laughed Mr. Brewster. The fellow is so badly scared he won't stop running until he reaches Serbot's camp. And the more he runs, returned Mr. Whitman, the more difficulty he will have finding it in the dark. Well, if Louise gets lost in the jungle, he won't talk to Serbot. I don't think it matters much, Hal. Louise has already told Serbot all he knows. 
except that we found out his game. Now he will tell that to Serbot, too, if he finds him. By the flickering firelight, Biff saw his father's face take on a troubled expression. You're right, Hal, decided Mr. Brewster grimly. I hadn't thought of that. It'd be better to catch Louis and take him along with us. It's probably too late now, but it may be worth a try. Mr. Brewster turned to Jacome. Call Louis and see if he answers. Jacome gave a long call. Louis! Louis! Faintly, like a faraway echo, a voice responded. A judo! A judo! In the firelight, Biff and Kamuka exchanged startled glances. Both had the same sudden thought, but it was Biff who exclaimed, The quicksand! Louise must have taken the same path that we did this afternoon. Jacome was calling, Louise, again, but this time there was no response. Mr. Brewster gave the prompt order, Bring lights and hurry. From the way the path showed in the gleam of their flashlights, it was plain that Louise could have followed it rapidly in the dark, for it formed the only opening through the brush. Biff and Kamuka, racing along beside Jacome, were the first to reach the arch of trees above the quicksand. They halted there, but saw no sign of a human figure in the muck. The glare revealed nothing but floating water flowers until Big Jacome pointed out what appeared to be a lily pad. Biff exclaimed, Louise's hat! It was lying brim downward in the ooze, beyond the bough from which Biff had rescued Kamuka. This time it was Kamuka who scrambled along the branch and used a big stick that Jacome tossed him to prod the quicksand, but with no result. From the bank, Mr. Brewster studied the scene grimly, noting that the farther out Kamuka jabbed the stick, the easier and deeper it went. That cry from Louise was his last, decided Mr. Brewster. In his flight, he must have plunged much farther than Kamuka did this afternoon. That is why the quicksand swallowed him much faster. From the bank, Jacome and other natives dragged the mire with stones attached to long liana vines, but received no answering tugs from the pulpy quicksand. When they pushed long sticks down into the mire, they went completely out of sight to stay. There's no reclaiming anything lost in those depths, Biff's father said soberly. That goes for Louise, too. When they returned to the campsite, Mr. Brewster dismantled the crude dummy that he had placed beside the fire. It was formed from wads of grass, palm stalks and small logs, which had made it bulky enough to be mistaken for a sleeping figure in the uncertain firelight. After what you told me, Mr. Brewster said to Biff and Kamuka, I decided to test Louise. I did everything but mention Joe Nara by name. I made this dummy figure so I could watch Louise if he tried to steal the map he had been told I carried. At the same time, I was guarding my life against his treachery. But, Dad, exclaimed Biff, Sorbot never told Louise to kill you. He simply told him to delay our safari. And to Louise's way of thinking, declared Mr. Brewster, the simplest way of accomplishing that would be by killing me. Here in the jungle, people think and act in very direct terms, particularly the natives. Mr. Brewster and Mr. Whitman began a discussion of the next steps to be taken. They agreed that the sooner the safari moved along, the better. Mr. Brewster put a question to Jacome. You have been to Piedra del Cruci before, Jacome. Could you find your way there again? I think so, Senor. Then you will be our guide as far as the big rock. Have the bearers ready to move at dawn. Daylight was tinting the vast canopy of jungle leaves when the safari started back toward the main trail. The setting was somber at this early hour, but the silence was soon broken by some scattered jungle cries. Then clear and sharp came the metallic note of the bellbird. Mr. Brewster waved the safari to a stop and said, Listen. The call was repeated. Mr. Brewster turned to Kamuka and asked, What kind of bird is that? Campanero or Urubu? Biff smiled at the way his father used the term for bellbird, along with Urubu's nickname of vulture. But Kamuka kept a very serious face as he replied, It is a rubu. Look, senor, I show you why. 
he pointed to a white feathered bird that formed a tiny spot on the high branch of a tree there is real campanero declared kamuka he is saying nothing he would answer if he heard real call mr brewster studied the bellbird through a pair of binoculars and promptly agreed with kamuka he handed the glasses to biff who noted that the bird which was something like a waxwing but larger had an appendage that extended from its forehead and draped down over its bill this ornament jet black in colour was starred with tiny tufts of feathers mr brewster called it a caruncle and explained that it was commonly seen on various species of tropical birds noted for their ringing cries but this bellbird remained silent even when the distant anvil sound clanged anew urubu is signalling for luiz declared mr brewster he may wait an hour or so and try again when serbot finally decides that we have moved on he will think that luiz is taking us the long way we should get a good head start right now the safari pressed forward at a quick pace which was maintained most of the day the going was not as hard as biff had anticipated luiz's talk of a tough trail had been a sham so that the party would be willing to take the long route even some of the streams they encountered were already bridged with fallen trees making crossing easy after one such crossing jacome suggested stopping to eat mr brewster opened some canned goods but most of the bearers preferred bowls of coarse cereal made from the manioc or cassava plant this formed their chief diet jacome gnawed on a large bone of leftover tapir meat when he had finished half of the meat he suddenly tossed the bone into the stream instantly the water flashed with silvery streaks in the shape of long sleek fish that fought for the bone and tore the remaining meat to shreds piranha grunted jacome they rip anybody who goes in water if we chop away tree urubu will have to stop to build new bridge to get across serbot might suspect something objected mr brewster if they guess that we are on the same trail ahead of them they will hurry it is better to let them think that they can take their time jacome still found time to fish for piranha during the short rest the cannibal fish practically leapt from the water to take the bait jacome took no chances with the sharp teeth that projected from their bulldog jaws he cut the lines and tossed the fish into a basket hooks and all when the safari made camp at dusk they cooked the piranha and the fish proved a tasty dinner indeed mr brewster kept the safari at a steady pace during the next few days in order to stay ahead of serbot's party jacome proved an excellent guide remembering every landmark along the trail one afternoon a rain ended as they trudged beside the bank of a sluggish stream and jacome pointed in the distance with the comment big rock there it was piedra del cuchay a huge stumpy shaft of granite towering hundreds of feet above the forest the rock was streaked with tiny trees that looked like sprinklings from the vast green vegetation that spread beneath though the natural boundary marker was still a day's march away the mere sight of it spurred on the safari in the light of dawn the big rock seemed much closer and within a few hours trek even its cracks and furrows showed sharply trails began to join and suddenly the trees spread as the safari emerged upon a sandy beach lapped by the black water of the rio negro there wasn't a sign of a boat nor of any habitation until kamuka pointed to a movement in the brush a few hundred feet downstream mr brewster stepped forward spreading his arms with a wide sweep if it's joe nara mr brewster told biff he will recognize us if not be ready to get back to shelter two figures bobbed into sight and biff recognized the squatty forms of ego and ubi they turned and gestured a few moments later they were joined by joe nara all three came forward to meet the safari nara was carrying a small package under his arm the bearers were laying down their packs and other equipment when nara cried excitedly 
We hoped it would be you, Brewster, but we weren't sure. The Makus have been attacking villages up and down the river. Everywhere we have heard the cry, Maku, Maku, until we— Hold it, Nara, broke in Mr. Brewster. We have more important things to talk about first. The native bearers were coming forward silently, and Biff realized that they were drawn by the dreaded word, Maku. But Mr. Brewster wasn't able to hush Joe Nara. What's more important than Maku headhunters, the old man demanded. If you don't believe me, Brewster, look at what I picked up down river. Before Mr. Brewster could stop him, Joe Nara ripped open the package that he carried. Under the eyes of the native bearers, who now were crowding close about him, Nara brought out a pair of shrunken human heads, triumphantly displaying one in each hand. End of chapter 9